The question was, um, was, was really how do we do, how do we, I think it's how do we do proper human level creativity in a sense, right? Is that what you're, you're asking? And you're pointing out that, 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 uh, that humans are capable of originality and investing their creations with their own personality and individuality, right? right? Uh, and, uh, and of course, you're absolutely right. And when I, 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 I owned up at the beginning that I can't really tell you how we're gonna get to human level AI, but really what I, all I want to do, to do at the moment is imagine the beginnings of how we might move in that direction. And there's a video that I very often uh, show when I'm talking about the kind of thing that interests me, which, uh, was, which is of Betty the Crow, who um, uh, does this amazing uh, thing of getting, um, of creating a tool, create, making a hook in order to get a bucket uh, with food in it out of a tube. And, uh, and that I think is, a, the, I see that as, a, as quite a remarkable, because Betty has never made this tool before and, and has never you know, seen a problem exactly like this before in, the, in that particular example. Um, and I think that's a remarkable example of, of creativity in a, in, in a sense. And I think it's just that the, what we see in, in things like that are the seeds of, of genuine creativity, you know, just the seeds of it, because what uh, uh, it seems that uh, that, that that crow has done in that situation is to have taken yeah, bits of behavioural repertoire that she already has and combined them in a completely new way. And of course it's nothing like the kind of thing that you've got in, in mind where there's originality and what the kind of thing we see in a work of art. But I, I feel that if we could understand how to achieve that, um, what, 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 uh, you know, what animals, the smartest animals are capable of doing, then we'd be, that would be the first step on the road to, uh, to, the, to, to genuine creativity. Okay, so, so, the, the, question, so uh, and the question was, don't I think that one of the problems with uh, a deep reinforcement learning agent like DQN is that it hasn't really identified the, the structure of the domain? Now, I really promise you that that question was not planted, right? Because I have a slide that perfectly addresses that uh, that. <laughs> so this is one of the many things I didn't quite get to. So I think one way in which you might approach this question of building a better predictive model f uh, for that, well, one of the, one of the things that you'd want to build into a better predictive model is, is, is that, uh, well, you know, the state space in question has this unknown combinatorial structure of kind of fundamental elements. And the first thing that you really want to do is discover what those fundamental elements are, right? This is very much, I think, what you, what you have in mind, yeah? So you want, you, know, you, you, you want it to somehow discover what the ontology of the domain are, to realize that what, the, you know, what are the fundamental set of objects and relations and actions that are involved in, this, in the domain that it's looking at. So you know, in particular, these bombs and these ships and their movements and the events like things being destroyed and so on, you'd want it to, but, but you need it to discover those things in an unsupervised way, and that's very hard, and that's something we don't know how, how to do yet. But that's, that's you know, absolutely you know, where I would like to sort of start going on this. And this comes down to um, some of the sort of uh, fundamental priors, if you like, of common sense, which is, which is the fact that the, 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 you know, the world is has got space, things are, are organized in space, that you have persistent objects and motion. Some of these things are sort of built into DQM, space, because a convolutional neural network, that inherently builds in the idea of space. But these other notions, like the persistence of, of objects and motion, uh, you know, the, no, priors like that aren't built into the current generation of, of, of neural networks in machine, machine learning. Yeah, so, so, um, so I think that you know, your predictive model so the very first sort of slide I showed, which had that very generic architecture, where I have a box that says predictive model or compressive model, um, I'm deliberately saying almost nothing about what that, that is going to look like, that predictive model. And it could take an enormous variety of different forms. And then I, I got, because I got interested in this work of Jeff uh, Hinton, uh, I, I, I sort of described in a little bit of detail a kind of hypothetical connectionist 
sort of predictive model. But it doesn't, ha you know, I'm not, I, I, I don't have any commitment at all to building things in that particular way. It seems like a pretty interesting idea, and because that approach, that deep learning approach, has been so successful recently, it makes me think, well, how far can we go with that? Uh, you know, if we really have an awful lot of data and we're really inventive with the kind of network architecture. So, so that's why I sort of took that particular idea and, and ran with it a little bit. But, but I think the predictive model could take all kinds of forms. It could be a symbolic model. It could be, uh, you know, it could be a um, sort of a Bayesian um, belief network type model. I, you know, who, who knows? There's a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a variety of possibilities. Uh, so the question was that the kinds of archi architectures I've been describing here don't incorporate long-term episodic memories. So, yeah, um, and, and so do I see, uh, uh, you know, what do I see as the role of, of, of episodic memory in, the, in these kinds of uh, architectures? Uh, I'm actually very interested in, 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 in episodic memory and, and I have an ongoing um, Horizon 2020 project called Timestorm. We're looking at... Uh, uh, episodic memory and, and so-called mental time travel is a part of the part of the project. And it's true that it, the, the, uh, the way I showed this architecture at the moment, it's not really apparent that that long-term memory or episodic memory would be part of it. So, I mean, I mean, the honest truth is that is that it won't take us very long to think of all kinds of ways that we might want to elaborate this architecture. And that certainly is 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 is, is one of them. And I guess the important, I guess the reason why episodic memory uh, is, Im is important is because, it's, is because we want to be able to learn from single instances of important events. So, so there might be some, you know, what just, what just a thing happens to you just once in your life and that's enough, you know, that is enough of an important story for you to learn from that particular instance. So I'm, you know, oh, I'm never going to, uh, you know, go to that restaurant again, you know, <laughs> and it, you, you, you're not, you don't have to go to the restaurant 25 times in order to figure out that, that, uh, that the food is bad. You only need one episodic memory. So I, I, I think of it as a kind of uh, an extension of, 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 of the kind of learning that we've been talking about here, but it's a sort of single shot learning where you just need one instance. And, and so, of course, we want to preserve those instances so that they can be recalled uh, whenever they're, they're analogous to a current situation or a situation we're imagining. Yeah, yeah. And, in f and so, so, the, the, so the volumes of data, uh, yeah, I mean, that's potentially prohibitive, but, but, um, uh, but on the other hand, I, I've, you know, experience has taught me not to, not to rule out the possibility that we're going to have that kind of quantity of data that will make these ideas work that you might th think don't work, right? There's this phrase, the unreasonable effectiveness of data, right? Which, uh, uh, it, it so, so in fact, these very sort of uh, algorithms that we're talking about here, like backpropagation, were actually not terribly effective in, in many ways until we had that much data and that much computing power to throw at them, and suddenly they be become a lot more effective. So now we're, we're imagining, imagining taking them to a kind of extra dimension here and you might think oh we'll never have enough data enough sort of videos all labeled and everything to be able to to, to do that but you know I don't know maybe we, maybe we will <laughs> you know so I, I, I certainly have no idea how to put numbers on that um, uh, so that was one part of the question what was the uh, well, second oh second order and third order yeah actually I had a whole I had a whole s I have a, a several slides on the idea of kind of ex extending this to kind of further further orders, but then uh, I realized um, that I don't, didn't understand my own slides, so I thought, I, I, but I think it's an idea well worth pursuing, but uh, I haven't kind of got my head around it, uh, around it yet. Yeah. It's really a, bad, a, matter of, a matter of kind of uh, having increase, in increasing your kind of time scale in a way, going up in, in, in time scale and up in abstraction, I think, is, 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 is the way you sort of would think of it, yeah. Yeah, so, the, so uh, to repeat the question was that, that much of the machine learning has been done uh, on uh, perceptual input, particularly vision, right? And um, so in a robotics context, we might uh, think of, of, uh, uh, think of, of, of learning in, in a, a sort of richer context, right? Where you have a, I, I guess you mean where there's a sensory motor loop. So, um, so, you, so you're, you're, you're interested in... Uh, 
in the degrees of freedom of the robot and the uh, proprioceptive input and so on as, as being part of it. And uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, and, and, and so I, I've no idea how we're going to deal with those kinds of problems. And of course, the control problems that you get. So the, the, so the other part of the architecture where you're, you, know, you want to produce the optimal action. So there are very, very difficult control challenges there with when you have a large number of degrees of freedom and a large space of actions. And one of the short, or one of the sort of limitations of the work that, that uh, DeepMind did in that Nature paper is that there's just a tiny number of actions you can do in with, with any of these Atari games. You just basically, you know, you've got a few keys which you're pressing. In a robotics context, it's a, it's a, you, you've got a, a, you know, a very much richer motor space that you want to explore. So I really don't know how that's going to be done. I couldn't honestly pretend that I have any idea uh, how that's going to be done. So, um, yeah, I don't know that I can say much more than that, except that it is, of course, important. And also moving to three-dimensional space. I mean, this is a two-dimensional uh, um, uh, the, you know, those examples are with two-dimensional space. So really we we're interested in something that moves around in, in a three-dimensional. Oh, uh, so, so some of that kind of work has, uh, uh, certainly has already uh, been done. So you can, you can uh, I mean, the, you know, the, the, the great thing about these neural networks is that, um, uh, is that, they, is that the, 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 the input layer is just a vector, right? So it can be anything you like. And, 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 and some of the most um, striking work has been on looking at images, so you're looking at two-dimensional arrays of pixels, but, but it can be, you know, it can be absolutely anything you want, of course. So it can be, um, uh, it can be connect data from a connect or a connect, you know, uh, uh, fusion, uh, or it could be uh, any kind of data that, that, that you like. So certainly people have done uh, quite a bit of work uh, on predicting Human motion, where where if you just pick out the you know the sort of standard collection of um, uh, joint uh, joint locations and uh, uh, and and uh, you can predict you know what the next movement is going to be from from where those joint angles are going. Um, so so yes, that's definitely you know that's that's certainly uh, um, doable and been done. Uh, I believe yeah. Okay so. So the question was, what kind of neural network do you use in, uh, for different kinds of learning problems? Uh, so the convolutional neural network is really where, where you have got spatially organized uh, input, so particularly uh, images. Um, so there, there you can take advantage of the fact that nearby things in space tend to have the same statistical properties, so you can share the weights uh, over a number of, you can look at, you know, you can look at patches and share the weights uh, uh, over um, the neurons that are looking at adjacent patches. Um, uh, so, so convolutional neural networks for, uh, for particularly for, for images. Recurrent neural networks are for sequential data. So uh, if you're interested in text, which is you know, a sequence of, uh, of words or a sequence of characters, um, or uh, indeed if you're interested in an audio signal, you can use all music, then so sequential data Recurrent neural networks uh, are, are what you, you'd be interested in. Um, so, uh, but I mean, there's, a, there's you know, I, I'm not going to pretend that I'm a, a huge expert on machine learning, and you know, it's not really, uh, really my field of expertise. Although I've been talking about it a fair bit, and there's plenty of you know excellent tutorials out there that can, and and and, and some good books uh, that can teach you about this about this stuff. But there's a variety of other you know, arch network architectures that, that, that you can look at, such as restricted Boltzmann machines, um, and, uh, and you can look at conditional restricted Boltzmann machines, which are also good for sequential data of a different sort. That's something that we've been playing with a little bit. So there's actually, there's actually quite a big uh, uh, kind of Meccano kit of, uh, of, of things elements of, arch of network architectures that you can plug together in different ways. And I think plugging them together in all kinds of different ways is, 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 is one of the you know, exciting things to do in machine learning. It's, it's one of the reasons that I've got interested in the area is that I can see how you can kind of plug together these elements in all kinds of different ways and build different sorts of architectures and explore, kind of explore yeah, architectural possibilities. And cognitive architectures is an area that's, that's you know, has always interested me. Thank you.